This YouTube video covers Schmollock et al, which is your contemporary study within the cognitive approach. Schmollock's study is named the semantic knowledge in patient HM and other patients with bilateral, medial and lateral temporal lobe lesions. Just remember that this is your cognitive contemporary study. This means that it might not be named on the exam. You will have to remember that this is what it is and therefore identify it in the question. Just to make sure that you're aware of the keywords before we go any further, when we're talking about encephalitis within the PowerPoint, we're talking about inflammation of the brain causing damage to the structures. When I'm referring to medial, I'm talking about the middle of the brain. Lateral refers to the side of the brain. Interior lateral refers to the front and the side of the brain. And bilateral refers to both hemispheres. There are lots of aims of Smollett's study. Uh, the first one was to investigate the effects of specific brain damage on semantic memory. Also to investigate the damage of the medial temporal lobe. Assess the relationship between test performance and the extent of damage to the lateral temporal cortex. To determine whether HM's performance was unique among the patients. Now, if you're not sure if who HM is, there's a different video on the YouTube channel to watch before you continue with this presentation. And to use case studies of brain damaged patients compared with normal patients in order to conclude, make conclusions about effects of brain damage and how that affects memory. Now, Schmalt used six participants and he matched them all for age, sex and education with the control group that he used. Now, three of his patients had amnesia after getting herpes through simple encephalitis, which we referred to at the beginning. Now, these patients had large, large medial temporal lobe lesions, as well as variable damage to the anterior lateral temporal cortex. He had two patients who had brain damage in the hippocampus, and then he used HM, who underwent bilateral medial temporal lobe surgery, surgery for relief of his epilepsy. Schmollock also had a control group of eight patients now, these eight healthy men were recruited as volunteers from the San Diego Veterans Affairs Medical Center, and they were matched to the older patients with respect to their age and education. Now, the tests that Schmollett used. Schmollett used nine tests, which were conducted over three to five different sessions with participants. Seven of these tests were from the semantic test battery, and two tests were constructed by the researchers. All of the tests were based on line drawings of 24 animals and 24 objects. Now, these 48 line drawings were then further categorised into eight groups. Now, all participants were given nine tests on three to five separate occasions, and seven of the tests, as we've just discussed, were from the semantic test battery, and two of them were constructed by the researchers. All of the nine tests were based on the same line drawings that we've just mentioned. And there was no time limit for participants to complete the test. Now, if you look at the screen now, here is an outline of the different tests that were used. You don't need to know every single one of these and you don't need to specify what each one was. But I would make sure that you have an overall knowledge of the test that he used. Now, after getting participants to complete these semantic memory tests, Schmollock found that on 13 of these tests, it was the patients with lesions limited to the hippocampus performed similarly to the control group, so they could name, point out and answer the questions, therefore suggesting at this stage that the hippocampus isn't playing a role within semantic memory. HM performed worse, but specifically on the task that asked him to define the objects. And his performance was only impaired on a few tests and was actually less impaired than the other three encephalitis patients. A ranking of the test scores showed a direct relationship between the impairment and the extent of damage to the lateral temporal cortex, suggesting that it is this lateral temporal cortex that is playing a role within semantic memory. Damage to the anterior lateral temporal cortex seemed to cause impairment in the semantic knowledge. If we look a little bit more detailed at some of the results on the test 1 to 9 here, particularly where we talk about HM, you can see that the patients with damage restricted largely to the hippocampus were still able to name, point out and answer questions about the objects with considerable accuracy. And they were comparable to the control group when they were asked to generate examples for category or to give definitions. It was the patients with damage to the medial temporal lobe and the anterior lateral temporal cortex that performed less well at naming, pointing out and answering the questions because they had considerable difficulty in generating examples in a given category. Notably, one of these patients couldn't generate the names of the dog breeds, despite the fact that he was previously a dog breeder. They had difficulty defining the objects, giving less detail and containing more errors. Now, this bit down here about HM is particularly interesting. Now, HM performed worse among all of these patients. 
Interestingly, the medial temporal lobe patients found it most difficult to identify and recall facts about living objects. When the participants were ranked in terms of their overall performance on these tasks, their rank appeared to correspond directly with the extent of brain damage, meaning that the worse their recall was correlated with the worse their brain damage was. Now, HM, as we've discussed already, performs similarly to the rest of the patients in terms of definite defining. But his semantic knowledge was in the normal range in all the other tests. Now, what was unique to HM was that he made a large number of grammatical errors during the test. And the researchers suggest that it's this deficit in language production. And it was unlikely to be related to his brain damage. But actually, they compared, they concluded that this was down to other factors that related to HM during his childhood. Now, if we go into that in a little bit more detail, HM suffered a seizure because he suffered from epilepsy at the age of 10. But he was from a low socioeconomic status. He had a low socioeconomic background and his schooling was interrupted because of his epilepsy. And the researchers conclude that it was these factors and not the biological factors that contributed to poor language development within HM. The researchers then concluded that the hippocampus is not therefore involved in semantic knowledge because the uh, HF patients perform similarly to the control group. HM was less affected than the medial temporal lobe patients, which leads to the conclusion that, that it's the anterior lateral temporal cortex and not the medial temporal lobe that's involved in semantic knowledge. The language impairment displayed in HM was unrelated. To conclude then, it's the damage to the anterior lateral temporal cortex which is consistent with the loss of semantic knowledge. The sem Semantic knowledge is associated with the anterior lateral region and not the medial temporal lobe, which is consistent with patients who suffer from semantic dementia, whose impairment is restricted to the anterior lateral, to the anterior lateral temporal cortex. The MRI, MRI scans seem to suggest that the more progressive disease, the greater the anterior lateral damage. And these findings and related findings from other studies all point to the importance of the anterior lateral temporal cortex for semantic knowledge. And that is the most important conclusion out of all of this and the one that you need to be able to remember and talk about in the exam. They also then concluded that HM was particularly a unique case and they took into account other factors, including his upbringing and explaining HM's brain damage. Again, if you've got to evaluate this study, consider the following factors. So they looked at case studies of brain damaged patients and therefore they are rare and small in number. Therefore, the small sample involved in the investigation limits the generalizability to the wider population. We also have to talk about individual differences, particularly in the case of HM. They've argued that the case of HM is a product of his upbringing and not necessarily his surgery for epilepsy. It could be argued that the individual differences found in this investigation demonstrate the individual vari variation in neurology, which may therefore account for the differences between the patients. It's also retrospective research because we cannot establish a cause and effect relationship between the injuries sustained and the results of the test. Now, this is quite simply because they don't know the working function of the brains of the patients before they suffered from the brain damage. Therefore, if they don't have a baseline, if they don't have something to compare to before the brain damage occurred, then they can't draw cause and effect relationships. An example of this here is HM. Everybody presumes that HM's differences are because of his brain damage, whereas this study actually says the opposite and says that his differences is because of his upbringing. There's also a clear lack of ecological validity within the study. The stimuli that are common to many cognitive investigations used to test semantic knowledge, such as the line drawing uh, used, lack mundane realism and therefore may not tap into the semantic knowledge as it's used in everyday life. Such research then may be said to lack ecological validity because the findings can't be generalised to everyday use of semantic memory. This means that the tests that we use are not how we use semantic knowledge in everyday life. 